Hi, I'm Annie Leonard with the story of stuff. Welcome to another episode of The Good Stuff, where we talk with people who are working on solutions to the take-make waste system that's trashing the planet, harming our health, and threatening our families and communities. Remember the Mad Hatter in Alice in Wonderland? Here's why he was mad. When the book was written, hat makers had a reputation for strange behavior, mood swings, insomnia, and trouble remembering things. It was caused by their exposure to mercury, once known as quicksilver, which in that day was used to cure the animal pelts that went into hats. Mercury is one of the most dangerous chemicals on the planet. There's no safe level of exposure. Just a little can cause brain and nerve damage. It's particularly harmful to unborn and developing babies, lowering their IQ and causing serious developmental defects. Most mercury gets into the environment through emissions from coal-burning power plants and from waste-burning incinerators. From these smokestacks, it's converted into a form that ends up in the fish we eat. That's why it's important to learn about what kinds of seafood, like tuna, have high levels of mercury and should be avoided. But mercury also is released from broken thermometers. Your mom was right to warn you not to touch it if a thermometer broke. That's why, for more than a decade, medical manufacturers in the U.S. have been phasing out the use of mercury and replacing it with safer digital electronic thermometers that work just as well. But what about the thermometers that were manufactured before the dangers of mercury were fully known? What happened to the leftover mercury at those factories? As we'll learn from today's guest, one thermometer manufacturer, part of a corporation that makes products we all use every day, shut down its factory and walked away. But the community threatened by this irresponsible behavior is fighting back. Let's find out more. You probably don't know the name Unilever, but you know its products. Dove soap, Lipton tea, Hellman's mayonnaise, Vaseline, and dozens more. One of its subsidiaries used to make mercury thermometers in the United States. But when the Environmental Protection Agency started cracking down, it moved its operation to India. Shweta Narayan works with the Community Environmental Monitor, based in Cuddalore, India. A few months ago, while she was visiting California, I talked with her about the organization's campaign to stop toxic air pollution from the hundreds of chemical factories around Kudalore. For these communities, survival itself is a big uh, challenge. And then on top of it, when they're being poisoned, when their health is being compromised, when the children are falling sick, to raise their voices or to need to get that support to strengthen their voices against these polluting facilities is, is a bigger challenge. So the idea of community environmental monitoring is to build capacity in these communities to enable them to monitor their environment, to develop data which is um, which can be easily understood by their their uh, Uh, community, and then, based on that, demand action from the government. Hundreds of miles to the south of Kudalore, Shweta's group is also working in Kodai Canal, a tourist area known for its scenic beauty and cool temperatures. But hidden in the mist swirling on the hilltops is the deadly legacy of a Unilever subsidiary called Hindustan Lever Limited, the waste from the manufacture of more than 150 million mercury thermometers. Shweta told us how the people of Kota Canal are struggling to make them clean it up. So in 1983, Unilever uh, basically shut down its facility in Watertown, New York, and this this facility used to manufacture mercury thermometers. And uh, it was shut down and transported to Kota Canal in India because of the increasingly stringent enforcement of the United States Environment Protection Agency, which in the late, during the late 70s and early 80s recognized the problems with mercury and started enforcing um, heavy regulations on agencies that were, or industries that were using mercury. And it did not made, uh, make economic sense for the company to continue. So they just shipped this toxic facility to a third world and continued operations. This facility was located in a residential area. It was registered as a glass manufacturing unit, so they never disclosed to the agencies that they were processing mercury. And for 18 years, they not only operated in a negligent manner, they also exposed their workers to mercury 
without letting them know the harms of mercury. This is in making mercury thermometers. Making mercury thermometers. They must have produced about 16.5 million mercury thermometers during its operation, during their operation. And they also, so uh, in 2001, the community groups came to know about uh, a big toxic dump, uh, contaminated uh, mercury glass. Uh, in the forest dumped by the factory, they discovered that dump. As a result, there was a big hue and cry and the factory was shut down. As of now, the factory con continues to be contaminated site, contaminated with mercury. And in Unilever continues to work behind the public scrutiny, work with um, the regulatory agencies in a, in a secret manner to dilute the standards for cleanup because it is India. Because so it's a third world. Unilever shut down the factory and just left, leaving behind this contaminated pile of mercury waste? Yes, Unilever still has the possession of the factory, so they still own the property, but they are delaying a proper cleanup of the facility, and they're just trying to uh, dilute the standards for cleanup, because the more stringent the standards of cleanup it is, the more expensive it is for the company to clean up. Now, in, 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 in Unilever is an Anglo-Dutch company, so in Netherlands or in UK, they would be made to do a very, very rigorous job, which is very expensive. But because they are in India and because they have the financial power to muscle their way through, they're trying to make this as lenient as possible so that they, they, they clean up, but they don't clean, do a good job. So the current standards that they're trying to negotiate with the agency would mean that if the cleanup was to be done to that standards, about 300 kilograms of mercury would be left behind in the soil. Can you tell me about some of the people who live around this site and what they're doing about it? Um, so there are a lot of workers, and uh, these are poor families which were uh, working in the Unilever factory, and, and that was their only source of employment. They um, have been exposed during the, um, their course of employment, and they are the ones who are living around this factory predominantly. But then um, this is also a tourist place. So a lot of floating population. This is a summer resort. It's a hill station. So a lot of people is, who want to escape the heat of them, I mean, during summers in Tamil Nadu, come to this place. So there is a uh, there is a fixed population that is recipient of these uh, the, the toxic contaminant, but there is also a significant floating population right from like young babies to older generation who, who are actually being exposed to mercury contamination. Not many people know about what Unilever has been doing. I mean, and they have the power and they have the money to advertise themselves as a very conscious, environmentally conscious, ecologically conscious, green company. But this is the unfortunate uh, criminal reality of their doings, wrongdoings in India. And this needs to be popularized. So in looking at how these corporate polluters act around the world, you mentioned the term double standards. Do you think these companies act different in rich countries compared to less industrialized ones? Absolutely. I mean, right from the standards that they adhere to in terms of pollution uh, regulation to uh, the way they look at um, responsibility, their responsibility post uh, operations, post operations. Um, I mean, why do you think they shut down their facility in New York in the first place? They, they did that because uh, the regulations were so stringent that their option was either to follow those regulations and spend more money or just shut operations and forget about that business. But at the same time, take the business to a Le uh, to a country which has let less stringent enforcement. I do understand that a lot of people say it's a problem with your government and your government is corrupt. Yes, it is a problem and we are working towards government accountability, but how can we let a corporation get away with this kind of crime? I think that's unacceptable. Community Environmental Monitor also works with survivors of the 1984 Bhopal tragedy, the world's worst chemical industrial disaster which exposed more than half a million people to deadly gases from a Union Carbide pesticide plant. Just as in Kota Canal, Union Carbide, since bought by Dow Chemical, tried to walk away from the problem. But Bhopal survivors and organizations like Shweta's are determined not to let them off the hook. Dow Chemical Corporation refuses to take up its responsibility towards the people of Bhopal in compensating them, providing them clean drinking water, and making sure that their medical cost is being taken care of and they're provided adequate medical rehabilitation. They refuse to do that because this is India. So um, in 2002, I uh, got a chance to meet one of the Bhopal survivors, a woman, um, her name was. Uh, her name is Tarabai. Her story is incredible, and her uh, the power. The, I mean, the 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 what she's doing today for 
survivors and for people around the world is incredible and very inspiring. So how old was she when the gas disaster happened? She was very young. I think she was in her 20s. She was seven months pregnant. She lost her baby on the night of the disaster. She lost her husband. She lost her only brother. And so basically, she lost her entire family. She lost 70% of her um, eyesight. So she, she cannot see very well. And especially when it's very bright, she is almost blind. Um, and um, so to me, it was incredible that she was even there in Bombay, traveling all the way from Bhopal, talking about Bhopal survivors. And I asked her because very normally, I mean, who would you fight for? It's your family first, right? You, your children, your, your parents or your spouse. So I asked her that, why are you fighting? I mean, you have nobody left to fight for and why are you fighting? And her response was um, for people like you. She looked at me and she said that because many few, uh, I mean, many women are not even aware of what's going ar around them and what's poisoning them and their futures. And we are fighting, we as Bhopal women are fighting for securing future for people like you and people outside, outside who have not suffered. They should not be, suffer what we have suffered. And it, this is a fight to establish that, that no chemical corporation can come and poison you and your future generations. It's that vision and determination that are also found in Kota Canal. Shweta's organization is working with the people of Kota Canal to expose Hindustan Lever's double standard and callous disregard for the community's health, to demand justice, and to pressure Indian authorities to hold the company accountable. People have gotten together and they're demanding accountability from the government and also from uh, Unilever. Last month, uh, school children launched a campaign in uh, Tamil Nadu, and it is called Have a Heart Campaign, where um, in one of the engagements, a school child uh, came up with this idea that the only reason why the government and Unilever is not doing anything um, substantial and concrete about uh, making sure that the site is clean up because they are heartless people. So the children decided to send them hearts. And so we have about 5,000 hearts that have come to, uh, that have been collected and that needs to be sent to Unilever CEOs and the Tamil Nadu government chief minister and other regulatory heads um, with messages on it to clean up, to make sure that children are being protected, people are being protected. So yeah, we have launched this Have a Heart campaign so if you have spare time, just draw a heart and send them hearts. What can um, people listening that are outside of India, what can they do? I'm sure that many of the listeners are outraged at the fact that Unilever would leave all this mercury contamination. You said it's a, a British and a Dutch company. What can people in Britain or Holland or, or here in the U.S., what can we do to support your campaign? Um, there's actually a lot of things that people can do, and um, every small uh, contribution will make a huge difference. One thing I think everybody understands that pollution and toxics has no barriers. So it doesn't matter whether it's one part of the globe that is getting contaminated. Eventually, it will come back to us in some way or the other. Um, uh, more importantly, immediately what can be done is questioning the government about Indian government especially, about why they are allowing a, a rich corporation like Unilever, which has the wherewithals to do a good job of cleanup, why are they allowing them to let go of their responsibility? Uh, questioning Unilever about it. Um, Unilever uh, 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 produces and markets a lot of uh, consumer goods, a lot of household products. so also letting them know, I mean, boycotting their product would be a very good way to let them know that we will not accept this kind of double standards where you try to sell us a product saying that it's eco-friendly or it is good for you. At the same time, you continue to poison men, women and children in another part of the world. Um, they have some of the most famous products like Dove is a one name that comes to my mind, Vaseline, um, Lux, uh, a lot of consumer brands um, uh, in terms of uh, they have some of the coffee and tea brands like Lipton and Brew. So, I mean, uh, there is a whole range of uh, brands that they have mentioned in their website on Unilever.com. So we could go there and we could take a pledge to at least boycott one product. And I'm sure all of us come across one or two Unilever products in our lives. So boycott um, Unilever products, but also let Unilever know why we're boycotting yes, them. Yes. So that is send very emails, send letters, um, tweet about them. Tweet about them, put it out on your uh, social ne networking site, make more people aware. I mean, uh, I, I, I sincerely feel that every individual has the power to bring about a change. And uh, it's just to realize that we have that power and we are not alone in this. Kadalore is not a fight alone. Bhopal is not alone. It is our responsibility to not only fight for us, but for, for our children, for our future, for our friends, for everybody around us.
Chueta and the people of Cota Canal are fighting an uphill battle. And it's too early to say if they will be able to bring Hindustan Lever to account for their environmental crimes. But their story is an inspiration to us all to realize that even when the forces against us seem insurmountable, we don't have to passively accept injustice. On our website, storyofstuff.org, you'll find links where you can give Unilever a piece of your mind and to an online petition calling on officials in India to make sure the corporation pays for cleanup of its subsidiary's mercury waste. Please add your voice and support the people of Kota Canal. That's it for this episode of The Good Stuff. Our show comes to you from the studios of Youth Radio in Oakland, California. Our engineer is James Rowland. The Good Stuff is produced by Bill Walker. We'll have another show online in a few weeks. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends. Find us on Facebook and storyofstuff.org and keep working on the good stuff in your own community. Thanks for being part of the solution.